when she walks in, I start to shiver. Her fragile hands peek out of her coat like bones nestled in cloth. The moment our eyes meet, she starts to pick at her nails. Please sit. She sits in the chair directly opposite, but does her best to look away from me. Her sunken eyes drift across my office, searching for something comforting to look at that isn't me. It doesn't take an empath to figure out that she's anxious, but beneath her discomfort, there is something else. I am not the first therapist she has seen. She doesn't think I can help her. Would you like to tell me what brings you here today? There is a pamphlet on my desk. A brain dead treatise of some janitor based medication scheme I was handed on my way to work. The girl ignores my question and instead stares at the smiling janitor on the flyer. Maria, would you like to tell me what brings you here today? She starts picking at her fingernails with greater fervor as if there was something hiding beneath her skin that she could unearth to get out of my office. Our eyes finally meet for more than a glance. My mother didn't tell you. We spoke, yes. But it would be best if you described it to me, in your own words, what brings you here today. My mother, she made me go. Her eyes drift back to the pamphlet. Even though the text is upside down, she attempts to read it. I gently slide the paper into my desk drawer, hoping that she'll let me in. She doesn't. Her attention quickly shifts to the pigeons outside. We are alone in the office, but it feels crowded. Maria, can I get you something to drink? A tea, some water? Uh, no, thank you. I am not the first therapist she has seen. She doesn't think that I can help her. I can. Or maybe something to eat. There is a terrific vending machine in the hall. This gets her attention. Maria, would you like to tell me what brings you here today? I can't eat. Would you like to elaborate on that? She sighs. For a moment, her fingers slow down. Yet, as she speaks, they pick up their pace once more. I'm constantly tired, constantly cold. I have no appetite for food and nothing helps. Nothing helps. My mother keeps on sending me to these places, but nothing helps. You have attended a hypnosis session before, yes? Yeah. Her mother told me who she sent her to. Novak. The man is a melancholic drunk who only keeps his office open to finance his drinking. I would be surprised if I ever met anyone who benefited from his therapeutic work. How did you find your work with Dr. Novak? Was there no improvement in your appetite at all? Nothing works. For how long have you not been able to eat? Long. Her mother blamed it on her friends. A bunch of children stopped eating in the village where Maria lived. It was as if all the kids had decided to starve themselves overnight. Her mother hoped that moving to the city would make her child eat again. She hoped that Maria getting away from the crowd of her skinny cohorts would help her gain some weight. It didn't. Do you have any guesses as to why you have this problem, Maria? Her mouth opens, but she doesn't speak. Floating in the recesses of her mind, the truth lingers, yet it cannot be put into words. A part of her knows why she starves herself, but that part has locked away from the world and the dark water of her subconscious. Novak could never reach that part. I know I can. Your mother suggested that maybe it was peer pressure from your friends, but I don't think that is true. You don't? I don't. Her tired eyes light up. As bizarre as the idea that someone would go on a purely liquid diet to impress their friends is, my rejection of the notion makes her smile. I am not the first therapist you have seen. There has to be some doubt in your mind as to whether people like me can help. 
I assure you I can. I can help you, but you need to trust me, Maria. Her exhausted eyes drifted back to my desk, searching for the pamphlet with the cheery janitor. They do not find it. What are you going to do? You are familiar with the concept of hypnosis from your work with Dr. Novak, yes? Well, we will be doing something similar. I will give you some instructions to help you relax, and if you follow my instructions, we should be able to get to an answer to your eating problems once and for all. Nothing scary, just some relaxation techniques to loosen up your mind, to get some answers to what's really bothering you. To make this work, though, to be able to help you, I need you to trust me, Maria. Her fingers continue to claw at her skin, but her bony face relaxes. Okay. Good. Now, Maria, could I ask you to open your eyes as wide as possible? What? Just try to open your eyes as wide as possible. I know it sounds silly, but just give it a try. Open them as wide as you can. Now, focus in on the way your face feels, the strain around your eyes. It's not comfortable, is it? You could very easily imagine the opposite of that sensation. Close your eyes and feel the opposite of that sensation. With her eyes bulging, the girl's skeletal face was the stuff of horror. But with her eyes closed, she looked almost peaceful, like a malnourished baby taking an afternoon nap. Her fingers stopped twitching, yet her breathing was still shallow. We are alone in the office, but it feels like I am performing for an audience. I want you to take a deep breath. Feel that relaxation around your eyes. Feel it slowly spread out through your body with every slow breath you take. You could open your eyes if you needed to, but let them relax. Hold on to that relaxation. While you hold on to that relaxation, your eyes can't open. You can't let go of that relaxation at any moment. You can get back control whenever you want, but hold on to it. Hold on to that relaxation around your eyes, and feel that calmness flow through the rest of your body. The room calms. There is still a shiver lingering in my spine, but I no longer feel the need to dig my fingers into my palm. I am not the first therapist she has seen, and chances are I won't be the last, but I can help. Good. Your body is relaxed. With each breath you take, you can feel that relaxation go deeper and deeper. Now, imagine that relaxation turned inwards. Relax your mind. Your body is holding on to that deep feeling of relaxation, but let your mind hold on to it too. In a moment, I will ask you to count backwards from 100. As you count, the numbers they will fade away and disappear from your head. With each number, you'll feel the physical relaxation of your body wash through your mind. The numbers will drop away as you count. They will disappear so that after just a couple numbers, the number will be totally gone. I want you to start counting back from 100 now. 100. Now push the numbers out of your head. 99. Watch how the numbers disappear. Feel how relaxed your mind is becoming. 98. Her head droops to the side. It doesn't take an empath to see that she's relaxed, but I can still feel some resistance. We are alone in my office, but something else lingers in the air. Ninety. Are all the numbers gone? Ever so gently, she nods. Good, now forget about the numbers. Just go deeper and deeper into that feeling of relaxation. Good, Maria. Do you remember the day your problem started? Ever so gently, she nods again. Can you tell me about that day? Her thin lips part, but she doesn't speak. Her fingers start to twitch. That's okay, Maria. Hold on to that relaxation. We don't have to talk about that yet. She wants to be helped. She trusts me. 
Yet, there's a part of her that is not ready to face the truth just yet. Latching onto the depths of her subconscious, there are memories that refuse to be seen in the light of day. With each breath, you feel yourself going deeper and deeper. Let the calmness in your body and mind guide your breath. Relax and imagine you are in an elevator. It's the 20th floor and the numbers are going down. With each number that passes you, you feel a new wave of relief and calmness wash through your body. You grow twice as relaxed with each number I count. 19. The numbers flicker on the screen. They drop away. You go deeper and deeper into the pool of relaxation and the numbers become irrelevant. 18. Her fingers cease to twitch. She breathes deep and low. I know I can help. Yet, just as I'm about to ask her about the day her problems with food begun, she startles me. The girl starts to hum a cheery song. Her head is still drooped to the side. She is still deep in a somnambolic state, yet she hums a cheery song. I feel with her. I share the trance with her. Yet on the fringes of my mind, I am beyond perplexed. Humming in her state is deeply irregular. The song is cheery in nature, as if it were the music coming from an ice cream truck, yet it's cut short in its repetition. There are notes missing. Something within her is stopping her from finishing the memory. What's that song, Maria? I... Her mouth opens, but she cannot speak. I ask about the day that her problem started, yet I am left with silence once more. That's okay, Maria. Hold on to the relaxation you felt before. Imagine you are back in the elevator on the 20th floor. Watch the numbers count down. Feel the relaxation in your body and mind double with each passing number. 19. I count. She begins to hum once more. I do not ask about the song. Instead, I ask about the day her problem started. Once again, she cannot speak. I take her back to the 20th floor. I count again and I ask again. And once more, I am met with silence. I'm not sure if the frustration I feel in my chest is hers or mine, but I feel it regardless. I try again, but I fail once more. I am unable to help. The shame of failure washes over me, and I fear she can feel it too. I almost give up. I almost consign myself to the same class of therapist as Novak. But then a desperate thought seizes me. I think of the pamphlet at my desk. Hold on to that relaxation. Enjoy that feeling of calmness. You are... You are a janitor and your mind is one long hallway. Her eyebrows twitch gently. Her index finger brushes against the tip of her thumb. I haven't lost your trust yet, but I am close. You are a janitor and your mind is one long hallway of spotless tile. Yet on that tile there's dirt. Dirt of worry, dirt of anxiety, dirt of the past. It does not matter right now. You can clean it away. You are a janitor. Grab your mop and move it back and forth. Back and forth. Back. Her breath moves along with the mop. She calms once more, sinking into a deeper state of relaxation than before. I marvel at how a pamphlet freely given out in the subway has managed to be more effective than clinical techniques. But I force that thought out of my mind. She starts to hum once more. What's that song, Maria? The truck. I hear the music every night. What truck, Maria? Mr. Mobino's ice cream truck. All the children in the village loved him. He was always nice and smiling, but... One day he changed. One day he changed and wasn't nice anymore. That's when my problem started. Do you want me to tell me about that day, Maria? The pigeons fly off the windowsill outside. 
Another chill travels up my spine. We are alone in the room, but it doesn't feel that way. I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep and something was telling me to go outside. And so I did. It was dark, but I could see I wasn't alone. The other kids were outside as well. Everyone was standing there as if they were waiting for something. All of the kids from the village were outside. And then... She starts to hum the song again. The tune haunts me. The idea of standing outside in the middle of the night, confused by the motivations of my own body, haunts me even more. Mr. Mobino's truck showed up, but it was different. It was bad. I wanted to run away, but I couldn't. I wanted to run away, but instead, I followed the truck. Everyone did. We all followed the truck to the edge of the village. A tear slides down her cheek. My eyes water. Whatever led her away from her home that night is inside of the office with us. I want to help her, but something feels wrong. I ignore my instincts. What happened at the edge of the village, Maria? Mr. Mobina opened the ice cream truck, but there was no ice cream. There were... there were hearts. Inside of the freezer, there were hearts. Still beating, bloody hearts. Her eyes bolt open. The girl stares at me in utter shock. It doesn't take an empath to figure out she is re-experiencing that horrible moment from her past. But I am there with her. I feel the grass at my bare feet. An air of undulterated evil flows like puffs of steam from the freezer of the truck. He shoved the sticks into the hearts and gave them to us. We had no choice. We had to. I feel the flesh in my mouth. There's something else in the room with us and it has demands. It claws at my stomach. It stretches its pulsing body through my throat. The girl didn't end up on a liquid dye because of her friends. She ended up the way she is because of that thing. It won't let her eat anything else. I feel a beating heart between my clenched teeth. My horror tears me away from the room, yet I can see her face calm. When I woke up in the morning, I tried telling my parents. I tried talking about Mr. Mobino and my friends, but uh, I couldn't. Whenever I tried talking about that night, the words would never come. Until... until now. My spit tastes like iron. She's smiling. The specter of the memory no longer seems to drain her. Yet beneath her voice I hear a steadily growing heartbeat. I clear my throat. I try to get a control of the situation. But how do you feel speaking about it now? I... Her eyes drift again. She looks past the door to the hallway. Can I go get something from the snack machine? Sure. She leaves the room, but I am not alone. I will never be alone again. Whatever demon masquerading as a repressed memory that I have exercised out of her will stay with me forever. Its claws are sunken deep into my stomach. My spit tastes of iron. The heart still beats in my mouth. Any semblance of joy leaves me. I feel desperately tired. My body is fragile, as if it was made of nothing but skin and bone. The idea of food, of lunch, or of ever eating again is repugnant. She dashes into the office with chocolate around her lips. She's beaming. I, I, can I call my mom? Sweat rolls down my back as I wake up in the middle of the night. The hypnosis session with Maria is carved into my mind. Everything prior to that afternoon feels like a distant memory of someone I can't empathize with. All I feel now is weakness and a razor-specific craving. Any attempt at eating solid food after the session was impossible, as were any attempts at practicing my craft. It didn't take me long to end up on a liquid diet. It didn't take me long to fall into despair. I hear the music in the night. 
I hear the music in the night and I run out barefoot into the street, hoping that I will see that truck, praying for a respite from my craving. Mr. Mobino never shows up. The night air carries the incomplete tune of his truck, yet it is nothing but a cruel jest. My spit tastes of blood. The heart still beats in my mouth and a hunger which I cannot comprehend flows through my veins. Once I am sure the ice cream truck is not coming, I go back inside of my apartment. My professional pride has prevented me from getting help, but even the grandest of boulders turns to sand when chipped away at for long enough. I am nothing but skin and bone. All of my food is powdered and mixed with water. I refuse to live life this way. The number for Dr. Novak's practice isn't hard to find. I pick up my phone.